Every year on Rosh Hashanah, as we open up the Torah reading, I always have the same question. Why do we read the sacrifice of Isaac on this day? Why not spend time reading about the calendar? It is the new year, after all. Instead, we spend time reading a narrative of an individual, and a rather disturbing one at that. So why do we do this? Because biblical narratives, like legends, novels, and comic books, reflect our values and help us to reflect on ourselves, which is, after all, the reason for the season. For instance, take a look at Magneto, a character in the Marvel X-Men universe. He starts off presented as a villain, wanting to destroy humans and create a government by mutants whom he calls Homo Superior. So, unredeemable monster, right? Until you get to his history and motivation. Magneto was once known as Erich Lenscher and was born in Germany after World War I. He was Jewish, lived in Warsaw. Perhaps you begin to see where this is going. As a child, he was sent to Auschwitz and suffered along with millions of other Jews, all because he was different. This experience changed him. He fights not because he views mutants as superior, but because he has seen what people do to those whom they see as other. For him, any means are justified as long as they could end up protecting those in danger. Whether or not we agree with Magneto, that motivation is a reflection of our own society, as is how he evolves. Seeing him move from a simple villain to a complex character illustrates a society that demands justification. It reflects the author's view that villains are heroes in their own eyes. So if that's the evolution of a character less than a century old, how about one that's more than 3,000 years old? Abraham, depending on which commentary you read on this story, is either an enlightened monotheist or a mindless zealot. His willingness to sacrifice Isaac is viewed by many as righteous obedience to God, but by some as cause for concern. There is more to this story, however, than meets the eye. When we dig deeper, we find that the location of the sacrifice of Isaac was Mount Moriah, a high point in Jerusalem. It looks down on valleys all around, one of which is called the Valley of Hinnom, in Hebrew, Geben Hinnom. That is, in fact, remarkably similar to the word used in rabbinic Hebrew for the place in the afterlife meant for those who do bad things, Gehinnom. As an aside, I want to take a moment to address everyone who is currently thinking, but Rabbi, Jews don't believe in hell. You're right, but you just said some Jews do believe in that Gehinnom place, and that sure sounds like a Jewish hell. That's also right. It sounds like you're telling me Jews both do and don't believe in hell. As Tevye would say, you know what? You are also right. Jews do not have a single clear belief in the afterlife. There are multiple beliefs depending on which source you read or rabbi you speak to. Why? Because Judaism's focus is on what we do in this world and how we treat each other. But back to what I was saying. There's a valley outside of the old city which shares a name with rabbinic hell. What's the connection? There is some archaeological evidence that, in biblical times, some religions which practiced child sacrifice did so in this valley, which would make sense. What could be an experience more soul-rending than watching a child be sacrificed? And so that is the setting in which our Torah reading today takes place. Abraham preparing to sacrifice his child on the highest peak above the valley of child sacrifice. And what then? He is stopped. An angel comes down yelling, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham answers just as loudly, Hineni, I am here. 
he is told to stop his child sacrifice in full view and hearing of all others and is told that this is not the sacrifice God desires. Can you imagine all the others in that area who see a divine being telling someone not to sacrifice a child, while those who have engaged in child sacrifice have never encountered the divine? It would be the ultimate rebuke to that practice, maybe a turning point in society. Perhaps, though nearly disastrous and certainly traumatic, it led to a change for good. Was that Abraham's plan all along? While both Magneto and Abraham may have come with the most noble of motives, the suffering they leave in their wake is terrible to behold. Magneto leaves chaos and grief throughout, and Abraham hurts those whom he loves most. Isaac has been changed for the rest of his life, being the patriarch who travels the least, who speaks the least, and who has the least independent action. Sarah dies, so the Midrash tells us, because she found out what Abraham did. For these two, Abraham and Magneto, the ends justified the means, and the consequences didn't matter as long as the point was made. That approach to life can be effective, but it is often counterproductive a boss who does this leaves employees burned out and resentful. A social movement that acts like this builds no bridges and cannot grow. The costs of short-term effectiveness can lead to long-term collapse. Something unique about Judaism is that it rejects this approach. It encourages us not only to engage with the end, but also with the process. As much as we may have been frustrated with the math teacher who demanded to see all of our work, there was a point. So too in Judaism. Giving an answer isn't enough. The Talmud isn't long just because it's a bunch of rabbis talking. It's long because each page is a journey in which the rabbis supply answers, ask questions, and demand proof. One of the pieces we read every day in the morning service, Rabbi Yishmael Omer, is a, really a list of how we argue and interpret. We learn in the Babylonian Talmud, in the tractate of Baba Metzia, that we cannot rely on miracles for proof, but rather only on argumentation. We call this today critical thinking. In fact, critical thinking is a paramount skill for engaging with Jewish text. Talmud study requires you to analyze each and every argument and to always ask why. Does the Talmud make an obvious statement? The response on the page is often pshita, la, tzricha. This is obvious? No, it is necessary. Every fact and situation has to be addressed. The unintended consequences and implications have to be unraveled before moving on. And sometimes, after days of deliberation, poring over texts, using three dictionaries, four commentaries, two posters, the rabbis reject the entire argument and go back to the beginning. The point is the method, not the result of the argument. In fact, it's incredibly rare for the Talmud to present the final decision. The opposite approach. A lack of willingness to enter into good faith debate can cause tremendous problems as well. Later in the Torah, we meet Aaron, who is given the title Pursuer of Peace. And yet, that can be taken too far. Aaron was so willing to pursue peace that he refused to act when the people made the golden calf. He accepted the desire of the people, ignored the clear instruction of God, and then, when confronted by Moses, said, The people put this gold into the fire, and out came this golden calf. Only the actions of Moses end up saving the people. Because as flawed as Moses is, no one can doubt that he is the greatest debater of all time. 
His quick thinking, speaking, and action are all that bring Israel back to God and stop them from worshiping a false idol. His willingness to debate even God is the key factor which saves the people of Israel from destruction. Abraham and Magneto and Moses are heroes when they stand on the side of righteousness, yet their inflexibility sometimes leads them to stand on dangerous ground. We see them as heroes when they dare to stand against power, when they see pain and suffering in the world with the acceptance of the status quo, and say no. And we see them as problematic when they don't question, when they act without thinking, when they just go and ignore all potential consequences. Two humans, Abraham and Magneto, millennia apart, who help us to understand the human mind and see how our actions impact the world superpowers, whether electromagnetism and control of metal or a direct connection to God, simply make the story more interesting. This is this, the ability to draw connections between our world and bring it into conversation with the text is the secret of Torah. Each and every generation that engages in Torah study sees itself in it. We have studied it for lifetimes, and yet there is always a new Devar Torah, a new connection to current events. Just as with works of fiction or graphic novels and comic books, the Torah reflects our values. In happy times, we see jokes, humor, absurdity. In dark times, we see pain, we notice the darker sides of those stories. And just as a mirror helps us to see ourselves physically, the Torah helps us to see our souls. What will you see when you read the Torah this year?